Okay, uh, welcome back. The next talk is by Makran Sina. Makran is a postdoc at CWI. Uh, before that, he was a graduate student at University of Washington, and even before that, a student at ETH Zurich and IIT Kanpur. He has done a lot of amazing research in areas such as communication complexity, quantum communication complexity, extension complexity, and so on. Uh, he has the unique distinction of uh, being a workshop organizer and as well as a speaker and uh, okay and today he'll teach us about extension complexity so this is going to be a tutorial this is my first ever tutorial so please ask lots of questions because i'm not sure i did a good job okay so this will be so now we'll switch gears and we will talk about something a little bit different extension complexity and then in the next talk you will see how it's related to lifting okay so let me start so the story starts back in the late 70s when uh, Kachin actually came up with a polynomial time algorithm for linear programming. So this was a big breakthrough in, in those days. You should read the newspaper articles because they're very interesting. So what's a linear program? So you, are, you want to optimize a linear function, which is a function of n variables, uh, subject to some uh, m linear constraints uh, given by these inequalities. So geometrically, this corresponds to you have a, a polytope in n dimensions with m facets, and you want to find the point in this polytope or in general polyhedra that uh, gives you the best possible value of this linear function. Okay. So Kachin and later Karmakar's result uh, showed that if you have such a linear program, the time to solve it is polynomial in the number of bits you need to describe this uh, system. And even though it's polynomial, the more inequalities you have in general, the more time you, your LP solvers will take to solve it. So be, here I should mention that sometimes it's possible to solve linear programs even though they have exponentially many inequalities in polynomial time, but this requires more ingenuity than just feeding it to an LP solver. Okay. So but in general, the time to solve the linear program depends on how many inequalities you have, because that's the description. All right. So that's, uh, so we can encode lots of problems as a linear program. So here's one famous problem, the traveling salesman problem. You're given a graph, you want to find the shortest tour in the graph given by some non-negative weights on the edges. Okay, so there is a very natural linear program that encodes it. You just optimize the linear function over the polytope, which is the TSP polytope. So you have a variable for each edge here, which is either zero or one, and uh, uh, the TSP polytope is just the convex hull of all possible solutions in the complete graph on n vertices. So this is a natural LP you can write down for this, and you can encode any graph. You can solve the TSP over any graph, because you can always encode your graph in the objective function. If you don't have an edge, you just put the weight zero, and if there is a non-negative weight, then that's the weight of the edge. And here the polytope only depends on the number of vertices you have, it's independent of the graph. So this is a very natural but a special kind of linear program. Okay, so in general, if you try to feed it to an NP solver, you will run into a problem because uh, they are exponentially, I mean, firstly, we don't even know what the facets of this polytope are, but we know that they are exponentially many. So how can we reduce the size of this uh, linear program? So back to the TSP polytope. So how can we write down a small linear program that solves this problem? So one very natural idea to do this is uh, what are called extended formulations. So you have your polytope, which is in the space of original variables x. You just add some extra variables y uh, to help you describe this uh, linear system more easily. And uh, so this geometrically lifts the polytope up to higher dimensional polytope. And what you want is somehow the polytope in the higher dimension is shadow in the original space is the original polytope. So then if you can, if you want to solve the problem over the original space, you can just optimize over this higher dimensional lift. Okay, so the hope is that using some extra variables allows you some extra freedom and allows you to reduce the number of inequalities. Okay, and in general, you know that there are examples where this freedom allows you to reduce the number of inequalities from exponential to polynomial. So this is what is called an extended formulation. It's just a higher dimensional lift of a polytope which projects to the polytope under some linear map. And the extension complexity of a polytope is just the minimum number of facets in any extended formulation or any higher dimensional lift for P. So it's the minimum number of inequalities you need to write down with some extra variables to describe this polytope. Okay, so let's come back to the traveling salesman problem. So 
I guess the, in the late 80s, people were really excited after Kachin's and Karmaker's breakthrough, and they, they were very optimistic back then, so they thought you could solve TSP in polynomial time. So Swart claimed that TSP had a polynomial size linear program that solves it, and this would imply P is equal to NP. I guess we are not optimi so optimistic now to be able to even try to prove this, so those different times. All right, so, but Swart's proof was incorrect, hit a bug, there were several iterations, they all had bugs. So I guess the legend, which was before my time, was that Yanakakis got frustrated and he proved his famous result, which is that any symmetric extended formulation for TSP must have true to the n size. So this killed Swartz's claim completely because his formulation was symmetric, and I will not define what symmetric means, but it means that if you permute the nodes of your vertices, then your polytope doesn't really change, okay? So this was back in the late 80s, and uh, I guess it was an open problem for a long time whether any, the, the, the symmetric restriction is necessary, whether there's still a linear program or extended formulation you can write down for TSP that is of polynomial size. And I guess it's known that for some polytopes allowing you non-symmetric extended formulation, it helps quite a lot. So from sub, some ex, from sub exponential you get exponential if you just, uh, for, if to polynomial, if you just allow non-symmetric, non-symmetric extended formulations. So this was a long open problem for a long time and uh, this was solved like five, six, six, seven years ago by Fiorini, Massar, Pakuta, Tivari and DeWolf by using connections to communication complexity. So they in fact proved that extension complexity of the TSP polytope, which means that any extended formulation must be of two to the n size. Okay, so this was, uh, sorry, they proved to the square root n size. So this was a big breakthrough, uh, and we are going to see the proof later today. Okay, and let's consider a slightly different problem now, which is maximum matching, because this is also an important part of the story. And again, you are given a graph with positive weights, and you want to find the heaviest matching in this graph. Okay, and as we all know, there is a polynomial time algorithm for it, but there is also a very natural linear program you can write down for this problem, which is you optimize this linear function over the matching polytope where again the matching polytope is defined similarly to the TSP polytope. You just take the convex hull of all possible solutions, uh, where it's a matching in the complete graph, okay? And it's also known that this has to do the n facets, which we will see later. Okay, so this is a polynomial time solvable problem, but this exp LP you write down is exponential size. And even though it's known to, I mean, you can solve this LP in polynomial time using a separation oracle, but this requires some more ingenuity, as I said before. But what's the shortest LP you can write down to uh, solve this problem? That's the first question. And this was also answered by Yanakakis back in the late 80s. It showed that any symmetric extended formulation, even for the matching polytope, which, for which you can solve the LP in polynomial time also, must be of two to the n size. Okay, and uh, I guess the long time open question is whether symmetry uh, really helps here. And in fact, the examples that I talked about where going to non-symmetric extended formulations helps a lot. They are in fact some versions of the matching polytope. So this was a long time open problem uh, to remove this symmetric condition. And again, in a breakthrough, uh, Rothfuss in 2014, he showed that any extended formulation uh, must be of two to the n size. And by reduction, this also improved the, improved the tight bound for the TSP polytope, that is extension complexity must be two to the n, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the number of inequalities you need, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, really, you can use uh, as large coefficient as you want, but even though it's, it, it will still be of exponential size. Good. Yeah, yeah, you can always assume this. Okay, so these are the two results we are going to talk about today. So mostly the outline of the rest of the talk will be, first I will talk about how do we prove lower bounds for extension complexity. Uh, this will require going back to the old proof of Yanakakis and relating it to communication complexity. And uh, then I will talk about how does the lower bound for the traveling salesman problem go. And I think here I should be able to give a complete proof because it's not so complicated. And the lower bound for matching, I will briefly sketch it. And then I will close with some other directions and open problems. Okay, so let's start with the uh, lower bound technique. So here is a very general lower bound recipe, which is already given by Anakakis. 
we want to prove extension complexity load bounds and it's related to something called the slack matrix and it's non negative rank and uh, uh, this is related to in turn proving load bounds on communication complexity as we will see later. In fact, all this connection was known but uh, uh, the big breakthrough was realizing how to prove non negative rank load bounds using communication complexity which uh, led to these load bounds. Okay, so let's look at the first connection. So what's the slack matrix? So you're given a polytope, let's say it can be described in two ways. The first is AX less than B which is a facet description of the polytope, you're describing the inequalities of this polytope. And the second is the convex hull description which is describing the vertices of this polytope. Okay, let's take a vertex of this polytope and let's take an equality. So the slack matrix is a matrix where rows are indexed by facets of this, uh, this polytope, the columns are indexed by vertices. So it's a very large matrix because in general there are exponentially many facets and inequalities, so in vertices. And the SIJ entry is just the distance from of that vertex from that inequality, which is just BI minus AIXJ. So it's the slack of the corresponding vertex from that corresponding inequality, okay. So the first thing to notice is that this uh, matrix is non negative because any vertex in the polytope satisfies that any every inequality here because that's how your polytope is defined. So this uh, slack will always be non-negative. So this is a non-negative matrix and uh, what we're interested in is the non-negative rank of this matrix which is the minimum R such that there are two matrices. You can factorize this matrix as UV uh, where U is like a long and uh, skinny matrix. Okay, so I mean one of the dimensions is R where R is going to be the rank and here U and V are required to be non-negative. So this another way to say is this the minimum R such that you can decompose your matrix S as a sum of R non-negative rank one matrices. So this is just the usual definition of rank with the non-negativity condition. So all right, so this is the slack matrix and we are interested in this non-negative rank. Okay, and in particular another way to state is that if you look at the ith row and jth column of u, i and v, then the inner product between those uh, vectors which are r dimensional vectors. Uh, is going to be your slack matrix entry. Okay, so so how do we go from extension complexity to slack matrices? So this was the connection given by Anakakis that extension complexity of a polytope P is equal to the non-negative rank of this slack matrix. Okay, so I'm hiding some technical conditions that P has to be have dimension at least one. Otherwise, there is identity factor missing. But yeah, for now, I will ignore this. All right, so. Uh, since we are interested in lower bounds here, let me try to prove this direction of the inequality uh, that the non-negative rank gives you a lower bound and the extension complexity, okay. And you can try to prove the other direction yourself is not that hard. Okay, so let looks, let's look at two polytope P and Q and Q is the extended formulation for P, okay, let's say, which is given by Ax plus Fy less than G, okay. So by assumption this has R inequalities and we want to uh, find a non-negative rank factorization uh, which is has rank R. Okay, so if you have a point xj in the polytope, it has some point which projects to it in the higher dimensional lift, let's call it xj yj. You can pick any such point. Okay, and if we look at any equality of this uh, polytope at the bottom, uh, it's also claim that it's also valid over the higher dimensional polytope because you can set, you can choose any y here the coefficient will always be zero, it will never matter, so it will also be valid over a higher dimensional object. And again here I'm I, for this proof I will choose the facets of the bottom polytope, but you can take any inequality that is valid or satisfied by all the points of P, okay. Okay, so one uh, very basic fact uh, in linear programming is that if you have an inequality that is valid over a polytope, you can always write it as a non-negative combination of the inequalities, defining inequalities of the polytope, okay. So I mean one way to think of it is these inequalities give you the minimum possible description of this polytope and if you add an extra inequality it's just redundant so it, it can be derived from all the other ones by taking non-negative combinations, okay. So our factorization the UI will just be this non-negative combination that we choose. Okay, since we have R inequalities this is going to be an R dimensional vector and this is non-negative, okay. And the properties it satisfies are written here but for now yeah. Okay, if you take these non-negative combinations of these inequalities, you get your modem inequality, the green inequality. All right, so this will be our UI and what are VJ? 
Vj will be the slack of the a point xj, yj at the top. And by slack, I mean uh, you look at the slack of this point uh, xj, yj from all the inequalities in Q. So again, there are inequalities, so this slack vector will be of length r. And again, since uh, these inequalities are valid over the polytope, the ex plus f y is less than g, this slack will also be non-negative. So this will be again r dimensional non-negative vector. All right. So now if you set everything up correctly, then if you take the inner product of these two vectors, uh, the first term here will be just give you bi, the second term will give you ai, and the last term will be zero. So this will, this is exactly like the slack matrix entry. Okay. So these uis and vjs, they give you uh, non-negative factorization of your slack matrix. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's for the original pole. Yeah, but this is a non-negative rank factorization of the slack matrix. That can, you can choose to be anything, okay? So we're just showing that there exists a non-negative rank factorization, but we're using the standard formulation to find it, okay? And again, as I mentioned here before, this is the, uh, here I just took the, in the slack matrix, I took the inequalities to be the facet defining inequalities of P, but here you can choose any inequalities that, that are valid over P and will still give you a lower bound. Uh, and this will be important later on, so just reminding you. So now we reduce the problem of lower bound, proving lower bounds on extension complexity to proving lower bounds on non-negative non rank. And uh, how do we prove lower bounds on non-negative non rank? Uh, this was also an old observation of Yanakakis that non-negative rank is bounded by the rectangle covering number of this like matrix. So let me define what that means. Probably a lot of people here know. So you have your slack matrix here, which can be written as a product of two non-negative vectors, okay? And again, rectangle, so I'm not sure what this audience is like, but probably everyone here knows it's a subset of rows and a subset of columns. So, so let me erase all the numbers here and just replace all the positive entries, strictly positive entries by plus, okay? So now, if you take any two columns, any two positive entries in a, in a column and any particular row and, and any positive entry there, and guess this gives you a rectangle which covers some positive entries in this matrix, okay? Because the product of any two positive entries was always positive. There are no cancellations here. And now if you look at the second row, uh, it will give you a different rectangle. And if you work it out, if you have R rows, it gives you R different rectangle that totally cover all the positive entries of your matrix, okay? So if you can prove a lower bound on how many rectangles you need to cover all the positive entries of your matrix, that gives you a lower bound on the non-negative rank, okay? So I mean, another way of, as people from communication complexity know, that a tank covering number is just a non-deterministic, one non-deterministic communication complexity. If this was a Boolean matrix, which is essentially is if you replace the pluses with ones, okay? All right, so this is one bound, one way to prove lower bound on non-negative rank. This was known for a long time. But here we have totally ignored the, what the entries in the matrix are. We only care whether they're positive or not. So that's a lot, a lot of information we have lost and sometimes it's not enough to, sometimes we need to use that information. So there is another way of proving lower bounds, which is the hyperplane separation bound or it's analog of discrepancy in communi uh, from communication complexity. So now you put some weights on the entries of your matrix and here the numerator is just the total weight of your matrix, slack matrix. And if you can prove the weight of your, any rectangle, small, and again, the inner product here is just this, you're just looking at all the entries in your matrix and it just, uh, it take, you're summing the total weight. So if you can prove the weight of any rectangle is small, then this lower bound essentially uh, says that the non-negative rank must be bound, lower bounded by uh, this weight divided by a maximum entry of S times the uh, uh, contribution of each rectangle, okay? So this is how many rectangles we need to cover it, essentially weighted rectangles in some sense. Okay, so is the statement clear? Okay, so let's go over the proof because it's pretty simple. So let S be uh, your matrix. It can be decomposed as a sum of R non-negative matrices, small little r non-negative matrices. Each has rank one. Okay, so now if you look at the inner product, you can kind of write it this way. So I pulled out the maximum entry of each Ri here. And this, uh, this entry is always bounded by alpha. Okay, so this uh, is bounded by alpha here. So, I mean, this is our, our assumption says that this is bounded by alpha. 
where r has 1 if your entry is in the rectangle and 0 otherwise. And in this case, at the bottom here, each entry here is uh, at most 1. And you can prove that the worst case of this occurs when the entry is exactly 1 or 0. So this is always bounded by alpha. Okay, so we get this bound. And now again, so you can prove that uh, since you are adding, since S is a sum of R non-negative matrices, there are no cancellations. So each entry of Ri is bounded by maximum entry of S. So this gives you this bound. Uh, and if you, if you rearrange it, you get the statement, okay. So the only difference from uh, communication setting is now we have real entries. So we have to care about what the entries in the matrices are now. So, okay. So these are two ways of proving lower bounds to generic ways. And we're going to use them to prove lower bounds today. So if you don't have any questions, let's try to move on to the lower bound for TSP. Okay, so this is the TSP polytope, just to remind you again. And we're going to prove that the extension complexity, this polytope is at least to the square root n, okay. And we are not directly going to prove a lower bound for the TSP polytope. We're going to use another polytope, the correlation polytope. So any questions there? Okay, so correlation polytope. So correlation polytope is a, you can prove that it's a face of the TSP polytope. So it's, so, and if you have, if you can prove that the face of a TSP polytope has high extension, then the whole polytope itself must have high extension complexity. And we are going to show that the correlation polytope uh, has extension complexity two to the square root n which will give you uh, this lower bound. And the correlation polytope, just to define it again, is the convex hull of all n, square root n by square root n rank one Boolean matrices, okay. So you have take a vector, square root n long, you just view the corresponding rank one matrix, uh, and you just take the convex hull of all such Boolean matrices, okay. All right, so what does the slack matrix for this polytope look like? So, I should mention that the facets of this polytope part, I don't think are known completely. So that's why I will use the freedom we had before uh, to choose different inequalities that are valid over the polytope, okay? So the vertex of this polytope are just BB transpose where B is a zero one matrix, a uh, zero one vector. And the inequalities we choose for this polytope by which uh, was the, I guess the big contribution of uh, this Fiorini et al paper because they found some valid inequalities that really allowed you to analyze this slack matrix. Uh, we'll choose these valid inequalities, okay? So the inequalities are given by A, where A is again a string of, or a vector, zero one vector in square root n. And the inequality is given is this, okay? So this notation means that you put A on the diagonal of this matrix and A, A transpose and X is just the matrix that's in the convex hull of this polytope, uh, these vectors. So it's again a, a convex combination of such rank one matrices. So I have not proved to the here that this inequality is valid, but we will see it in a second. So and the slack matrix entry will be given by uh, these, these vertices and this inequalities, okay? So the slack uh, for a particular vertex and inequality is given by this quantity. This is just by definition because you plug in BB transpose there instead of X. And now if you work it out, this is equals to the one minus the inner product plus the inner product square. And this is, which as we all know is this, okay? So since this is a square, now you show that the slack is always non-negative, okay? So this also shows that this inequality is always valid over the polytope because the slack is always non-negative. At the bottom x, yeah, this, uh, here this should be xx transpose, I guess, yeah. And then I'm plugging in bb transpose there, yeah, okay. And uh, I think, uh, so now to really analyze this matrix. Yeah, 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 but the slack will be, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so to really analyze this matrix, it will be helpful to view our, these uh, zero one vectors as indicator vectors for sets over square root n universe, okay? So if you view it that way, then the inner product of A and B is just the intersection size of A and B. So now this uh, entry is exactly, it only depends on the size of the intersection of A and B. And, uh, Okay, and again, if you work it out, now I'm only going to care about two types of entries in this matrix. So if the intersection size is zero, so that means the sets are disjoint, then this entry is just one, okay? And the other type of entry is when the, inter the sets intersect in exactly one element, and then the slack matrix entry is zero because you plug in one there.
No, that's what I said, right? That uh, if in the proof that we just saw, you can choose any valid inequality and it will still give you lower bound. The upper bound the equality is not true, but like it will still give you lower bound. And it makes it easier to prove lower bounds because you can choose anything you want. Okay. Okay. And the rest of the entries I'm not going to care about, so I'm going to cover them with the stars. But we know that they are at least uh, they are positive, but yeah. And so as we all know from communication complexity, this is the unique disjoint matrix. And uh, the rectangle covering number of this matrix has been long, long being known. It's, it follows from our work of Rasborough, that was observed by De Wolf, that the rectangle covering number of this matrix is to the square root n. So this already gives you a non-active rank lower bound on this matrix. Okay. So at least this is clear. Okay. But if you know, don't know this, how does this lower bound go? Here I'm going to show you complete proof, which uh, is pretty simple. Okay. So and this is due to Kalban and Veltke. So this does not prove a randomized communication lower bound. It's a lower bound only in the non-deterministic I mean, communication of one of unique disjointness. And I'm going to prove that the rectangle covering number of th this matrix is 1.5 to the square root n. So you need this many rectangles to cover all the one entries in this matrix. Okay. So how many one entries are here? Okay. So it's the number of sets that are disjoint. So for each element uh, in the universe square root n. Yeah. So when you talk about the covering number, you don't care about the star. The rectangles can cover the star. Yeah, the rectangles can cover the star, but they cannot cover the zeros. Yeah. So how many one entries are here? Uh, so the number of one entries are the number of disjoint sets over square root n size. For each element you have three choices because you cannot include any element in both sets. And so the number of entries is, number of one entries in this matrix is 3 theta square root n. And what the main claim will be that the maximum size of any set of one entries that can be covered by one single rectangle with no zero entries is 2 to the square root n. Okay. So then you would need at least 3 to the square root n divided by 2 to the square root n rectangles to cover it. And this proves the rectangle covering number bound. Okay. Okay. So now I'll just focus on proving this claim. Okay. So uh, let me call any such set. Let's fix any such set. It has one entries that can be covered by a single rectangle. So this is the blue part here, and I call this set T. Okay. And T can be covered by a single rectangle. Sorry. So again, I think my picture is again wrong. So this I change it from ones to zeros. Okay. So this zero. Yeah. This can be covered by a single rectangle, but these zeros shouldn't be here. Okay, so maybe a better picture next time. All right, so these, imagine they can be covered by a single rectangle and you don't, you never hit a zero. So for this proof, it's actually better for us to view them as indicator vectors because then the notation would be simpler. So now I'll divide this matrix into four parts. Uh, so now I'll index them by strings, which are square root n minus one bits. And here the last bit is zero, last bit is one, last bit is zero, last bit is one, okay? So just partition them into these four halves. And uh, A and B, which will be uh, square root n minus one bits, uh, they are disjoint if your element is in T because uh, one entry in the slack matrix means your sets are disjoint, so all the bits are disjoint. So even these square root n minus one bits are also disjoint, okay? So let me define two sets, T, R, and T, C, which are going to be subsets of this set T. Uh, R stands for row and T, C stands for column, you will see in a second. So TR will be all the entries of T that are in this half, this quadrant, okay? So this set, for example, you take all those entries. And in addition to that, also you would also include in TR all the entries that are in this quadrant, but that whose corresponding thing, if you flip the bit, is not in the bottom quadrant, okay? So it will be these entries here. So this is how TR is defined, and we define TC analogously, but along the columns the top part. So definition is clear. All right. So, okay, this is, you have to believe for now, but you can check it in your mind if, if you have nothing else to do, if you zone out for a second, that uh, by induction, you can prove that now these uh, square root n minus one bits, uh, these TR and TC will give you like a set of one entries that can be covered by a single rectangle, but now they are on universe of size square root n minus one. And by induction, you can prove that this is of size at most two to the square root n minus one. The base case is the empty set, so it's easy to check. So now this implies that now I'm going to claim that this TR and TC is not going to be like this picture. It will completely cover this set, the blue elements here. Okay. And so T must be size twice to the square root n minus one. So this gives you an upper bound. Okay. So this is all that is left to prove is that this is true. And then we will 
be done. Okay. Yeah, so let's, let's ignore all the non-relevant entries of this matrix and focus on only the relevant entries. So if we have any entry that's uh, uh, not covered by these elements, it must be in here because we covered all the elements already, okay, by uh, definition. So it must be in here in this quadrant. And if I look at the corresponding entry at the bottom, this must be in our set because that's how we defined it. Okay. If an element is not covered in the set, then it must be covered here. And similarly, if we go along the rows also, that first corresponding element will also be in our set here. So, okay, so now the key point is that if you look at this entry, which will be in this particular rectangle, I mean, your this set is covered by a single rectangle. So this entry is supposed to be covered by a non-zero rectangle. But by definition, these A and B were disjoint, and in this rectangle, we we are flipping the last bit. So we have included the last, only the last element, and none of the other, all the the rest of the uh, subsets are disjoint. So this entry, uh, it's, it's the sets uniquely intersect here. So this slack matrix entry is actually zero. So this must be in our rectangle, and so this this is a contradiction, and so we are done. Okay. So. That proves that the rectangle covering number of this uh, matrix is 1.5 to the square root n, and uh, this gives you our lower bound. Okay, so this was the first lower bound. Okay, so let's move on to the matching polytope. Okay, again the definition is the convex hull of all matchings in the complete graph, and again the theorem we're going to prove that the extension complexity of this polytope is 2 to the n. Okay, so. Yeah, so we'll prove a lower bound of 2 to the n on the matching polytope, and it turns out the matching polytope is also a face of some TSP, of the TSP polytope, and uh, that will give you the tight lower bound of 2 to the n. Okay, so for this actually, let's go back to what the facets of the matching polytope looks like, which probably most of people know here. So already proven by Edmonds back in the late mid 60s. So the polytope has three defining qualities. You have uh, the non-negativity constraints that all the variables must be positive, non-negative. You have the matching constraint that each edge each vertex can have at most one edge incident to it, and the bottom constraints are the odd cut constraints that for any odd set of vertices, you can pair at most q minus one over two of them inside, and one edge always has to go outside the cut. So again, this has two to the n, there are two to the n constraints of the last type roughly, so this has exponentially many facets, and again let me mention that if you are considering just a bipartite matching polytope, which is the convex hull of all matching is in the complete bipartite graph, then you don't need dot side constraints and then in fact the polytope has a small description. So what's the slack matrix for this polytope look like? So again the columns will be the vertices of the matching polytope. So instead of picking all possible vertices, I will only pick some, some of them. So this will be a sub matrix, so I'll only pick the perfect matchings, okay, uh, in the complete graph. And the rows are the facets of the matching polytope. And here, instead of picking all facets, I will just look at the facets corresponding to odd cuts. Okay. So the U M entry of this matrix is given by, so you have to believe me, but you can check this easily, that the U M entry of this matrix is given by the edges of the matching M that cross this cut minus one up to some scaling, okay, of two. So an example, if your cut is the, the green thing here, maybe it's two, and you have this matching, this perfect matching, then here, uh, three edges of this matching are crossing this cut because these two edges don't cross. So this entry is three minus one over two, which is one, okay? Just an example, okay? And we're going to prove that the non-negative rank of this slack matrix is essentially two to the n. So let's see. So the first tool we have is rectangle covering. So let's just try that. So, but unfortunately it doesn't work because the rectangle covering number of this matrix is n to the four. And let's see that. So note that this entry as the, of the slack matrix, so it's exactly one edge, is crossing, one edge of M is crossing U, which means that this vertex is tight for this constraint, then this entry is zero. Otherwise, this entry will always be positive, which means that at least two edges of M will cross. And these are the only non-negative entries, okay? So now I'll pick a rectangle. I pick any two edges, even an E2, of, and I will look at this rectangle, which is given by all cuts, where these are the only crossing edges, uh, where these are the, where these edges cross, they go outside the cut. So I will never pick a cut where these edges are inside. And for matchings, I will take any matching that extends this partial matching of two edges, okay? So this defines a single rectangle. Uh, I cover all these cuts and matchings by this single rectangle. And if I go over all possible rectangles, where n to the four of them, then essentially you can see that they cover all the positive entries in this matrix, okay? Next question is, uh, 
does this uh, covering actually give you a non-active rank decomposition? So if you just sum these entries, these rectangles, does it actually equal to S or not? And uh, again, if you try to, if you have an entry where you have K crossing edges, and this entry here will be K minus one over two. But if you have K crossing edges, for example, here you have five crossing edges, then that entry will be covered by like five choose two rectangles. Okay, so in general, it will be covered by K choose two rectangles. You cannot see it, but yes, K choose two. Okay, so the weight of the uh, right hand side will be much, much larger. Okay, so the weights will not match up. And the first question is, is this always true? Okay. And to formalize this, now we will need the uh, hyperplane separation well, because this the rectangle separation was not enough. So just to remind you, I will put weights on the entries of this matrix, uh, which will be large. The total weight will be large, but the weight of each rectangle will be small. Okay, so let's see what the weights will be. Okay, so let me define QK to be all the pairs, all the entries in this matrix, all the pairs UM, uh, where K edges are crossing. So the entry here will be K minus one over two. And let's define the following weights. So the weight, so if there is one crossing edge, which means that the entry in the slack matrix is zero, then I'll put the weight of minus infinity, okay? So minus infinity, you can just take to some very large number, okay? And uh, so basically this is uh, meant to ensure that our rectangle will penalize this entry very, very badly because this weight will be minus infinity. So we don't want it to cover that. And for the one entry, which will correspond to three matching edges, I'll put a one plus epsilon. And I'll weight, I'll spread uniformly over all the three entries. Uh, for the two entries, I'll put a weight of minus half, and I'll again spread it uniformly over all the five entries. And all the other entries, I'll put a weight of zero, okay? So, so what is the weight of the whole matrix? So the only contribution here, it comes from, so uh, the blue and the yellow entries, because the other entries always contribute to zero. Either the weight is zero or the entry is zero, okay? So the total contribution is given by so I spread a weight of uh, one plus epsilon here, and the entry here is one, and the Q3 will cancel out. So this will give you one plus epsilon. The second term will, the entry here is two, and here is minus one half. So this will give you one. So the total weight of this matrix is epsilon, okay? And epsilon will choose it to be, let's say some small constant, 0 0.01 or something. The total weight of this matrix is some small constant. Okay, and we're going to prove that the weight of any rectangle is in fact two to the minus n then by the hyperplane separation bound, we get this lower bound, and the maximum entry of this matrix uh, is again, it's the number of edges, which is polynomial, so you still get a exponential lower bound, okay? Okay, so let's uh, briefly sketch how this follows. So let me define again, you know, QK was uh, all the entries with K, and PK is just the uniform measure on all the K entries, or all the entries in QK. So all the entries in the slack matrix, K crossing edges. So the main lemma that Roth was proved was that if your rectangle really avoids all the zero entries, then the measure of all the, the three entries and five entries, then the rectangle must look like the following. It must have a lot of blue entries, which corresponds to the five entries than green entries, okay? So this is like a corruption round sort of statement, okay? If, uh, if you're familiar with communication, uh, but it just, it's just saying that the measure of the blue entries must be much, much greater because if you plug in the measure of the blue entries was one, then it's saying that the measure of the green entries must be at 0.4 roughly. So this must be a very unbalanced rectangle up to some small error, point to the minus cn. So now let's look at how this implies our statement. If you look at the weight of uh, our rectangle, this is one plus epsilon times p3 of R because I spread the one plus epsilon weight uniformly over all the entries in Q. And the contribution of the five thing will be minus one half, okay? And the first term here by this lemma, if I plug this here, it's one plus epsilon times four over 10 minus one half, okay? So I guess the key point here is that if you choose epsilon to be small enough, the first term here is close to 0.4, second term is minus one half. So the first term will be negative. So this entry you can bound by two to the minus Cn. And this will give you a lower bound, okay? Uh, so, I mean, the crucial difference here is that from communication is that here we're really choosing the weights of our matrix could be in negative, okay? And that really helps us, all right? So this proof of this lemma is actually fairly, I mean, it has some very nice ideas, but I think uh, this is too much for this, this venue, so I'm not going to talk about it. Okay, but I hope you get the idea. So, so this proves the lower bound for the, matching photo.
Okay. Yeah. Can you say what is the implication of having like a lot of magnetic fields also called which is a crazy point? Sorry? Is this something with the implication of having like a crazy point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it just shows you that these accidental formulations are not really, that's, I mean, in some cases they, we thought they were very powerful, but I mean, there are problems which you can solve by a linear program with separation oracles in polynomial time, but you can still, they still don't have like a small extended formulation. So, it's sort of a weak model of uh, computation. But again, yeah, these bounds are totally unconditional. They don't rely on any assumptions. So, that's the, I guess, the cool part. Okay, so. I'll briefly mention, so there has been lots of work here. Here is some, some list of all the papers which uh, I know of. There, there are more which I don't know of, so I, I might have missed some. <laughs> but uh, there has been a lot of lower bounds on proving extension complexity with many explicit polytopes because there you can always do these reductions between polytopes or you can relate it to communication complexity and use other techniques to prove lower bounds like the schools and Watson paper. So these are lower bounds for explicit polytopes and their extension complexity. And there is lower bounds for how much you can do with extended formulations when it comes to approximations. And there are a lot of lower bounds known here, a lot of work here. Uh, and I guess the next talk will be, Pravesh will talk about uh, Axcart and CSPs. And here you actually use some lifting theorems to prove these lower bounds in some cases. And there are also the notion of positive semi-definite extension complexity, which I'm not going to define here. Or it's analog of uh, is high dimensional lists for PIS, for P, uh, STPs. And here also we have some lower bounds now, but not for matching, but uh, for some problems, some exponential lower bounds. And uh, I guess uh, there is also connections between circuits and proof complexity. So like already uh, Pratish mentioned, there is a connection between bonus and cartridge model game and extent formulations. So that's how this Gush and Watson paper proved this lower bound. Actually, the lower bound doesn't work on that, but that's how the connection was noticed. But uh, there was uh, there were some results which act actually proved upper bounds for extended formulations using circuits. And again, this is a very recent uh, result, which uh, essentially shows that if you prove strong enough lower bounds for non-negative rank or extension complexity, you actually do get monotone circuit lower bounds or even circuit lower bounds and uh, some the uh, span program lower bounds, I guess. All right, so that was the brief summary of what's out there in the world. Okay, so let me mention a couple of open problems. So first this concerns the knapsack problem. So the knapsack polytope, or the, more precisely the max knapsack polytope, which is defined to be the convex hull of all zero one vectors, satisfying the single inequality. So you, have, you want to pack, you want to take at least B items and given by these weights, and you want to pack as much of them. And it's known by result of Goose, Jan, and Watson that the extension complexity, the exact extension complexity is true n over log n. And we know that you can do one plus epsilon approximation for this with uh, n to the one over epsilon size. And for, can we prove any lower bound for this or is this tight or is this the polynomial? Because there's a f beta type LP that approximates this. This is widely open. Nothing is known about approximation here. So this is a p-test type behavior, it's polynomial in n, but not for a fixed epsilon. And is there f p-test type LP or is there a lower bound? It's not known. Okay, and the second problem is the matching folds up. So I'm not going to define what the positive semi definite extension formulation is, but is there a post, can you prove a lower bound or is there one of, is there SDP that represents the matching fold up that is of polynomial size? Okay, so I guess that's the end. Thank you. Okay, questions? So here, like in like the motivation for doing the extension is to reduce the number of inequalities, right? And then still be able to deconstruct the solution by doing uh, the projection. So what was the last thing you said? And still, like after you introduce new variables, you still want to get the solution yeah. by doing the projection. So does it uh, in any like is there an increase in generality by just asking the projection to not just be you know like a simple projection down to the first x variables, but you can like use the values of the new variables that you've added y in an non-trivial way. So, I mean, I just defined it to be this way, but uh, you can take any linear map there, so as long as it's linear. So, linear reduces this. Yeah, yeah, because you can always uh, transform, apply linear transformation, assume this is the, always the setting, okay. Yeah, but non linear, yeah, I don't know, yeah. Uh, and this is interesting in the setting, but uh, the you get to the omega and bounds for a polytope defined as uh, 
So that's the right answer. We know for a random polytope that's the right answer. It's known like it's 2 to the n over 2 or something. And I guess this Gauss Jan Watson paper that comes closest, it goes 2 to the n over log n, but yeah, there is some gap there. Right? Thank you.